Hi, welcome everyone. And we are excited to be here with the Napa County Library Program to present on tips for success with succulent plants. The UC Master Gardener program was started in Napa County 25 years ago. So 2020, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. The UC Master Gardeners is a volunteer organization hosted through the Cooperative Extension Office in Napa County. And our mission is to provide research-based information in, on home gardening, pest management, and sustainable landscaping to the residents of California guided by core principles and our strategic initiatives. We welcome you to join us through our website and get more information about the Master Gardener program on this website shown here. And now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. It's Patty, one of our wonderful volunteers who is going to present on success with succulent plants. Go ahead, Patty, and I will give you the ability to speak. Let me unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Patty. All right, thanks, Siobhan. During tonight's 30 minute presentation, we will be touching on the following. The difference between succulents and cacti, identification of seven common genera, succulents for inside and outdoor, winter versus summer dormancy, soil and potting mixes, container versus ground plantings, maintenance, common problems of indoor outdoor succulents, and propagation. So people often use the term succulents and cacti interchangeably, which is scientifically incorrect. Succulents are just plants that store water in their stems, roots, and leaves. There are about 60 different plant families and about 300 genera within the 60 families in which succulents can be found. The cacti family is one of them. There are estimated 20,000 species of succulents in the world. Succulents can be found in just about every environment on, in our planet which includes deserts, rainforests, and semi-arid regions of North and South America. Succulents are indigenous to many parts of the world. Typically, they come from Africa, Central America, and the Northern uh, European Alps, South America, and South Africa. Cacti are only indigenous from Alaska to Chile in the Western Hemisphere. Cacti are fleshy plants that store water, making them part of this group. The most distinguishing feature for the cacti are the aerials, from which their flower, branches, and spines sprout. No other plant has this feature. Therefore, all cacti are succulents, but not all succulents are cacti. Aeoniums. Many people think of these big fancy tree aeoniums when you hear the name aeonium, but there are some dwarf varieties too, and you will see this later on in the presentation. So black aeonias are very popular and sought after. Everyone wants the darkest. These black aeoniums appear black at first glance, but actually it's a dark burgundy. This is more evident when it's backlit. The darkest varieties are short cop, black rose, and black knight. The value of the black color becomes deeper in full sun. Aeoniums grow during the cool season and go dormant during the summer to conserve its energy. Most aeonium heads reach between 12 and 15 inches across, and they can be two feet tall. Aeoniums are monocarpic, which means the plant dies after it flowers. Aeoniums are native to the Canary Islands. The genus Agave is a dense, diverse, is a big, diverse group of plants. There are approximately 200 species of agave that are currently recognized. The leaves unfurl from a tight bud. Most agaves only flower once during their lifetime, which is 20 to 30 years, and almost all agaves die after flowering, monocarpic, but not before it's produced many offsets at its base to replace it. The photo in the lower right corner is an agave americana blooming at a height of 30 feet. It's quite spectacular, and if you've never seen it, Morning Sun Farm says that they have one blooming on the property right now. It really does resemble a gigantic asparagus spear. The flowers produce musky perfume to attract pollinators. Many species of the agave are bat pollinated. There's a wide range of size from one to 10 feet and even some nearly spineless varieties now. They grow in warm and cool seasons. 
agaves are native to North America. So on this next slide is a close-up of the agave leaf unfolding. The marks of the leaf that was once so tightly held together in that bud are forever impressed on the underside of the neighboring leaf. I think this is just a beautiful thing. The next group of plants are the aloes. They grow in rosettes and unlike the agave leaves that unfurl, the aloe leaves grow from the center. These plants have long flower spikes bearing clusters of red, orange, or yellow tubular flowers. The group is very diverse, some being very grass-like in size and others being 60-foot trunks. Water your aloes deeply but infrequently, allowing the soil to dry completely to avoid rot. They don't appreciate or really wet winters, so they are perfect for a pot if you can so you can relocate it as needed. Aloes are native to South, America, to South Africa. The next group is Echeverias. Again, a very versatile plant that grows well in our area with good air circulation and bright shade. It has a nickname of hens and chicks. This refers to the mother plant being the hen and the little chick offsets being the chicks. Um, the flowers attract hummingbirds and bees. Don't let water sit on the rosettes to avoid, so do avoid overhead watering. Or if you do water in the morning, you're probably gonna want to control snails and earwigs which chew on the leaves. Echeveria are native to Mexico. The next group is Semper vivum. They're also referred to as hen as chicks or house leaves. They're very popular succulent with a neat rosette, tightly packed pointed leaves that come in a variety of forms, colors, and textures. Not all of the clusters of the Semper vivum rosettes bloom at the same time, so when a flower dies, the rest can still be in bloom and be very attractive. They are summer dormant, with most of the growth occurring in winter. Semper vivums can actually survive in areas where snow is on the ground. They're native to North Europe. The table on the lower left can kind of help you begin to tell the difference between these two genera of succulents. Uh, knowing the subtle differences of the leaves and the chicks and the flowers and the growth period should begin to make that difference easier to spot. So first of all, the Echeveria leaves are more plump and then there's fewer in the rosette, whereas the Semper vivums are flatter leaves, more of them. And then in that green picture on the top middle, it shows you a good example of the serration that's on the leaves. So the chicks for the Semper vivums in the lower corner, you can see that they're splayed out from the hen pretty well, you can see them, whereas the Echeveria holds the chicks tight, close to the hen. The flower of the Semper vivum grows on this stubby little stalk and the flowers resemble asters, whereas the Echeveria, they bend over like bells. It's not always easy to tell the difference between them, um, because on top of it, there are lots of hybrids being made right now and they take characteristics from each genera and then it becomes kind of difficult. So the next group of succulents is the sedum, also known as stone crop. It again varies in size and shape from ground covers to hedging shrubs. They've been categorized in sub publications as suitable ground covers, but please don't walk on them That'll only crush them and make them more susceptible to pests and disease. Just plant them off to the side of a stepping stone. Showy, starry-shaped, brightly colored flowers are born in stemmed clusters in late summer and provide interesting autumn color as they dry. Sedum is native to the Mediterranean. The next group is the deadliest. The nickname is Live Forevers, and they were once grouped with the Echeverias because of the obvious similarities. The plant forms low-growing rosettes, and the flowers are born on vertical stems. Because Dudleyas are actually dormant in the summer, they need very little, if any, water once they are established. I have actually seen wild Dudleyas virtually disappear in summer, only to reappear and rehydrate in winter. Most of their growing occurs in winter. So the Dudleya farinosa, the upper left photos, that's the only coastal Dudleya north of the Golden Gate and extends as far, in, as, as far as Southern Oregon. Other names include 
bluff lettuce or powdery live forever. The Dudleya farinosa is our West Coast California native succulent. So the Native Plant Protection Act on the next slide was actually enacted in 1977 and it prohibits the take of endangered or rare native plants but includes some exceptions for agricultural clearing of canals, creation of roads, and some nursery operations. Dudley F. Farinosa is, a des is designated by the act as a rare native plant. Many native species of Dudley are very highly sensitive and dependent on specific conditions found only in their specific coastal habitat. And unfortunately, a sudden demand for this wild succulent's unique color and leaf shape for ornamental use in China and Korea has led to thousands of Dudley succulents being stolen or poached from the California Ocean Bluffs. So the next photo shows that in March of 2018, two people were caught with 30 boxes of Dudleys in their rented minivan. When the officers emptied the boxes, they counted 850 Dudleys. In their countries, these would sell for between 40 and $80 a piece on the black market. The poachers were ordered to replant all of them, which took a while, and were brought up on felony charges. They eventually pled guilty to felony grand theft and were ordered to leave the country to avoid a two-year prison sentence. Each was ordered to pay $10,000 fines. So this has been happening on the California coast since at least 2015, they estimate. The California Fish and Wildlife ultimately were tipped off in April of 2018 by a person complaining about the long line in the post office. One man was sending 30 boxes twice a month for two years to Asia. They inspected the boxes thinking it was poached abalone but found the deadly of plants. The California Fish and Wildlife now has trained dogs to sniff out and detect these poachers. Yay dogs. The most unfortunate thing is that deadly are grown easily in a nursery setting. And because many species of the wild Dudleya are dependent on the growing conditions found on the coastal habitat, the survival rate for the plants that are smuggled out of the country is low. So the California Department of Fish and Wildlife war game wardens typically spend most of their time looking for abalone poachers. So when the Dudleya crisis arose, they reached out to a number of partners, including the Redwood National and State Parks, and the California Native Plant Society. The community rallied quickly together and organized these Dudley replanting parties like the ones shown here. How can you help curb poaching? Well, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife officers hope that the public will serve as their eyes and ears out there on the landscape and let authorities know if they see suspicious behavior or outright poaching. So I provided the number, or you can text the, to the um, text tip 411, and that will also get you an anonymous form. So, getting started. Growing succulents is easy and they can thrive without too much fuss. Here are a few things to consider before you buy to improve your chances that you pick the right plant for the right place. Begin by looking for undamaged plants. Read the label. Probably the most important thing you can get from the label is its cold hardiness. Evaluate the different environments that you have at home in which the plant could flourish. Is it the sunny kitchen windowsill, the dappled light in the corner of your front porch, or mixed in with your low water Mediterranean plants in the backyard? These are, these are the top five succulents for inside. They include the jade plant, aloe vera, echeveria, zebra plant, that's a hawthornia attenuata, and the mother in law tongues, tons of various species. Just remember to water sparingly, provide good drainage, and pay attention to light requirements. Hardy succulents for outside. The first two on the list we talked about were agaves and saprobivum, which can take full sun and are pretty hardy in cold temperatures. Many think because succulents are found in hot, arid environments that they can take any amount of sun, when in fact they can but they will benefit from some afternoon shade. We talked about the variety of aloes and the fact that good drainage is a must during wet winters. And the last three, Aeonium, Cedium, and Dudleya, do best with less sun intensity. This short presentation discusses the most common easily grown containers, easily, easily obtained varieties, 
planted in the home landscape. Some other common types of succulents that we didn't include here are Hawthonias, Euphorbias, Crassula, and Kalanchoa. There are definitely those who like to collect the unusual from nurseries who specialize in succulents. Buying locally is always promoted, but if you do buy from outside the county or online, make an appointment to have your plants inspected by the Napa County Ag Commission to ensure that your plants aren't hosting some unwanted pests. Containers and growing medium. If you're planting in containers, you're creating your own microclimate. Because succulents like water, but don't like wet feet, select a wide, narrow pot and fill it quick, with quick draining soil. If you're using the right soil and pot, you will probably need to water about every 10 days. Place your potted plant in a location that meets the plant needs for sun and temperature. Soil. So you can find pre-made special soil mixes for a variety of plants easily. For potting up succulents, choose a cactus mix. Typical ingredients include pumice, aged fir bark, aged redwood, and sand, a mix that is fast draining and low in organic material. Or you can create your own soil mix. This is one of UC Davis's soil blends for growing succulents. Again, good drainage with little organic matter. So the advantage of using containers, since all the succulents need excellent drainage, which can be a challenge in our dense clay soil, containers offer the obvious advantage. Containers are above ground level, increasing the ability to soil for soil to drain quickly and dry up between waterings. They can be filled with the appropriate fast draining soil mix with low in organic matter and be positioned and watered as needed, depending on the species requirement. If the succulent is a little frost tender, then having it in a container lets you move it to a more protected area for winter. So we've gone over the variety of sizes and shapes of succulents and noted that they fall into either summer or winter dormant categories. Um, did we miss that slide, Yvonne? Oh no, we missed it again. I do. This is important. So succulents are resilient and can look beautiful all year round, but in fact, there are some times of year when they become inactive. You need to know which ones you have. Is it winter or summer dormant? So, so you'll know when they don't want water or when it's okay time to disrupt the plant with repotting or trimming, or when would be the most productive time to attempt vegetative propagation. So agave, echeveria, sempervivum are or all winter dormant which means they grow in summer. Summer is the best time to trim, repot, and propagate. Aeonium, aloe, and dudlia are summer dormant, and they do their best growing in winter. So now we can go back to planting your container. So we've gone over the various sizes, shapes, and sizes of succulents. I noted that they fall into either summer or winter dormant categories. So when you're planting them together in a container, make sure to group plants with a similar requirement. Plant gently, putting the tallest towards the back, play with the various groupings of color and textures, and monitor your container. Rotate or reposition if they're elongating towards the sun. Maybe even take advantage of a sunny wall and create some succulent shelving as shown in the next slide. So planting in the garden. If you don't have soil that drains easily, planting your succulents on mounds is a good way to overcome that requirement. Planting on mounds will also offer some degree of frost protection by elevating the plant. The best time to plant is during the growth period. And that's either spring or fall, depending on what you have. Know the ultimate height of your plant. Choose a spectacular location for the vertical star of the show. Or maybe it's two large specimens with a few medium height plants for balance. You could aim to group a few select varieties and repeat them in a few areas and use lower varieties for the foreground. But do be aware of those succulents with spines and locate them where they won't cause any harm to skin, animals, or cars. Know the ultimate spread of your plant so you don't have to redo, thin, or edit your planting area too frequently. Remember, you don't have to cover the ground 100%. 
it's a nice relief for the eyes to see some negative space too. So in this next slide here, got newly planted in the corner, and then the lower right, it's probably three to four years. It really depends on the location, the soil, water, food, sun exposure of that particular spot, and which varieties grow really fast. So maintenance, watering. There is no specific rule on how much water, because it is such a diverse group of plants. Water thoroughly and infrequently during the morning. Containers will need more attention. Fertilizing. To encourage growth, fertilize with a balanced liquid fertilizer like a 10-10-10, for example, once a month during the growing season. It can be at half strength. Stay away from oil such as fish oil, as they can remove that powdery coating if it gets on the leaves. Grooming. Succulents are very slow to lose their older leaves, so you can pluck off the dried basil leaves and spent flowers stalked at any time. If these old leaves are to remain, they could actually hold excess moisture close to the stem and lead to rot. So wait until you see the signs of new growth to repot, shape, and trim excess growth before this growth period. So for summer growers, this would mean March, and for winter growers, it would mean August. Fast growing robust species can be usually repotted or pruned at any time. And it's best to propagate while the plant is actively growing. So next slide shows a little troubleshooting for indoor issues. Even though we say succulents are low maintenance, they're not no maintenance. Some of the growing conditions, they might've changed and we have failed to keep up with them. The most common succulent ailments are caused by too much water. The top three photos are the result of too much moisture. The photo on the left had leaves turn yellow and become soggy and drop off. The center photo has that buildup of dead leaves, which we talked about holding moisture close to the stem. And then the photo on the right, obviously looks like it's in a container that doesn't have any drainage at all and there was rot. So always provide proper drainage and let indoor succulents dry between waterings, remove old leaves and flowers. Legginess or plant elongation is caused by insufficient light and it's easily remedied by trimming the long growth and relocating it to a brighter spot. If the plant seems to always be dry, it's most likely needs to be repotted into something bigger. Plants that aren't getting the appropriate water, light, or food can become stressed and susceptible to pests and disease. Common indoor pests include scale and mealybug. For scale, isolate the plant from other plants, move it outside if you have to, spray it down with some isopropyl alcohol, and scrape the scales off gently with your thumb, repot with fresh soil. On the next slide, you're gonna see mealybug. So here we have a mealybug infestation on an indoor zygocactus, which is probably caused by plant stress due to too small of a container. Use cotton swabs with isopropyl alcohol to clean off the pest. Trim the long foliage and transplant into a larger pot with fresh soil. And while you're at it, check the roots for mealybug as well. Check out the UC Master Gardener website for information on other plant pests and their control. So maintenance for outdoor issues? Well, pests outdoor for succulents may include slugs, snails, and vertebrates such as gophers and deer. And picking early in the morning is the most effective way for controlling the slug and snail population. And there's also baiting you can do. Physical barriers are needed for the vertebrates, such as maybe buried wire cages for people who have gophers and bird netting or fencing for those who have deer issues. The severity of the deer foraging is unique to your area and depends on the amount of food that deer have in the wild versus how many delicious edible plants your neighborhood has to lure them in. Succulents are a form of water for them. Edema is a condition that often results when we have really wet winters. The succulents, which are already holding a lot of water in their leaves, stems and roots, can't handle any more. And as a result, their cells expand and form blisters. There's no remedy. The disfigured leaves will ultimately be replaced with new ones. Overwinter damage can be caused by frost and hail. Wait until spring or until after the last frost to trim off the damaged foliage. Either relocate the frost sensitive species to a more protected area or cover with frost cloth before the next year's frost arrives. 
excessive morning sun exposure or extreme heat can further be exacerbated if there's water on the leaves. So water in the mornings, make sure there's a chance to get the water off the plants. The other tip is when you're planting the plants with the big rosettes, is to plant them at an angle so they naturally drain themselves. So the next section, we're gonna talk about how they propagate by themselves. So this first slide shows a succulent propagating via a bull bill. This is Haworthia fasciata. It bloomed and then the very tip of the bloom turned into a new plant. The new plant is called the bull bill. In terms of orchids, when orchids do this, they call the new plant the kiki. Haworthias are winter growers. The next slide shows propagation via aerial roots. This is Aeonium decorum green pinwheel. I thought it was a sempervivum for the longest time. Obviously, this plant wanted to get bigger, two feet actually. It escaped the pot and with these aerial roots, it found a source of more food and water outside the pot. The roots growing under the stem act like buttress roots and they hold the plant up. The stem can be cut into multiple pieces seeing as the whole length is lined with roots already. This is one of the dwarf varieties of Aeonium I mentioned earlier. So this is self-propagation via offshoot. So these are photos of the same plant. The color looks different because it was moved from Marin to Napa and into a less sheltered location. The photo on the left was the first year propagated cutting and it produced 14 offshoots. All the offshoots were given away to an MG succulent workshop to the attendees. So this is also why you need to come to our workshops. Free plant. Now I wasn't sure if that same plant could produce offshoots again, but the following year it made 21 offshoots, which is a 50% increase. We'll see what happens next year. Semper vivums are supposed to be monocarpic, which die after flowering, but so far this one has not yet flowered. Maybe it's because I keep removing the offspring. I'm not sure yet. So vegetative plant propagation. You're gonna need sharp, clean clip clippers. This affecting can be done with alcohol or bleach. Just know that if using bleach, it may be a more effective cleaner, but it's corrosive to metal. So you have to wipe it afterwards and then oil the tool. Some people use a flame to clean the tool. Whichever you use, disinfecting your tool and keeping them sharp is a good practice, which may reduce the likelihood of transmitting diseases from infected plants to healthy ones. So selecting healthy cuttings. Vegetative propagation is achieved by either using the leaf or the stem of the succulent. When removing the leaf, you must make sure that you get the whole leaf all the way down to where it connects with the stem. And this can be done with a gentle twist. And using a stem cutting, remove any flowers or flower buds to allow it to use its energy and stored carbohydrates for root and shoot formation rather than flower and seed production. Depending on the variety of succulent, a stem cutting that has at least two growth nodes could vary between two inches to six inches. And the next slide will show you where the growth nodes are on a plant. So this diagram shows all the places on the plant where growth occurs. We know that plants grow upwards at the shoot apical meristem and makes roots at the root apical meristem. But the plant can actually grow at each node along the stem if given the proper environment. When taking a stem cutting, include at least two growth nodes along the stem for burial beneath the top of the cutting. Vegetative propagation. The most important step in vegetative propagation is to let the succulent leaf or stem dry and callus over for at least one to two days. Thicker pieces will require more time. Succulents hold a lot of water and will rot if fresh cuts are put directly into soil and watered. It's a good idea that if you're drawing pieces of the medial or the mid stem of succulents, to make sure you keep them oriented in a vertical position so you know which way is up. So you prepare the callus leaves, prepared callus leaves, they're not buried in the soil, but they're rather placed on top of the moist soil. Small roots and a new succulent will appear from that base. Keep it moist by misting, and in time, the original leaf can be removed. 
prepared calla stems to be planted in a pre-made hole in the moist soil. Inserting the, the stem into the soil on its own without making a hole first can actually damage the callus tissue and open it up to infection and possible rot. With the exception of aeonium, all succulents can be propagated via leaf or stem cuttings. The aeonium can only be propagated by stem cutting. This sempervivum leaf was actually propagated on the radio dash of my car without soil. Apparently there's ample moisture in my car or maybe it liked the music. This is a list of some great reference materials, some of which we used for this presentation. This reference page will be posted on our website as a separate PDF for your use and quick access. This is the Napa County Master Gardener website. And this is how you navigate into the website to find more areas of information. If you select this first area, gardening question selections, it links you right away to our help desk, UC publications, vegetable planting calendars, healthy garden tips, water-wise gardening info, to name a few. And if you click over here to events find us, it goes right to the slides and presentations for this event, as well as past events if you miss them. It gives you guides to our tree walk, our rose walk, and our social media links. Questions? Yvonne, let's look to see if we have any questions from the audience that were written up in the chat room. I can't hear you, so I'm gonna go in your room. Okay. Okay, so there's no questions on the chat. Um, but we can see if uh, anybody wants to type in, there's some more questions here. Let's see. So there is a question about uh, what is the website address? The easiest way to find our website for the Master Gardener website is to just type in Napa MG. If you Google or search for Napa MG, you'll get to our website. It is listed in this slideshow and I can go back that slide. Two slides, here we go. There's our uh, Master Gardener website. There's also a question about, can you see the presentation again? <laughs> it is available on our website, as it mentions here on this slide, you can go to our website. It'll be posted as a slideshow so that you can just scan through it. And we'll also post it as a video recording, but that will take us a few more days. I also see a question here um, about making succulent terrariums that don't have uh, a bottom drainage. And it says, is that not a good idea? So I know we did a workshop recently on, um, we did a workshop recently on creating terrariums with succulents as well as other kinds of structures and shapes that you can plant into almost anything. Um, you can put some, um, activated charcoal and sand in the bottom of the container that can help allow the drainage to come, the water to come out. And it, you do have to be really careful with terrariums that you're not overwatering because succulents do like really good drainage. And if you have any problems with not appropriate drainage, then you'll have issues with uh, rot in your plants. There's also a question here. Um, I just bought some succulents but it's not March or August. Can I repot them or should I wait? So it depends. It's gonna depend on the type of succulent it is. As Patty mentioned during the slide presentation, I'm answering for her, but she's nodding her head. <laughs> um, during the presentation, she mentioned that some are summer growers and some are winter growers. So what you wanna make sure is that you have the right kind of plant that can be growing in, actively growing in the season that you're trying to replant it. You don't wanna propagate or um, plant things in the wrong time of year or they won't, they won't have the energy to get going because they're in, dormance, in dormancy. Let's see, I see some more questions. Um, let's see, why do Christmas cactus bloom in May? 
it's when they have the right energy, I guess. <laughs> in my house, they always they always bloom for Thanksgiving, so we call them the Thanksgiving cactus. <laughs> I guess it may depend on the temperature and light exposure that they have, perhaps. Um, we might have to investigate that further. There might be different varieties, um, too. There's a question here that says they are Amorium Aeronomiums. I don't know what that is. I'm there sorry, there I'm were some sorry. listed on our dormancy list, and I believe that was one of the winter dormant. Oh, okay. That, so um, Amorium or Borium? Yeah, we can go back and look at that. Sorry. All right. Let me, um, let me mute Patty here. We're getting a little feedback. Okay, uh, see, there's a few more questions. Hold on just a moment here. Let's see. What should I, so Carol's asking, what should I do to take care of Christmas cactus other than keep it shake? I'm not sure what that means. They can like fertilize and make it look like So Patty's suggesting that you have regular fertilizer with a liquid fertilizer is probably the balanced. best. A balanced fertilizer is important. You don't want something that's going to have too much of any one of the three main nutrients. A balanced fertilizer will have something on the label that will say they'll have, there'll be three numbers listed. You want those three numbers to be the same, whether it's 555 or 20, 20, 20. If it's an organic fertilizer, it may not have all three of those particular items in it. See, I want to propagate burrow's tail sedum from leaves. Is now a good time? We'll have to check I back. I think sedum was on the winter dormant list, so that would be fine. That's one of the things that you can just lay on the surface, those little beans that you can just lay on the surface of the soil and keep moist. I hope, hope people can hear that. <laughs> that was Patty answering. She said she thinks that this is a good time for the sedum to be propagated. You can lay it on the surface. So let's see, Lisa is asking, I've seen succulents attached with chicken wire to a picture frame. Uh, what soil would be used for that? Those are um, vertical, uh, those wire frames are designed as vertical gardening and they do have to re be replaced fairly often because the plants don't want to grow sideways. So they're going to grow up and it, the frames actually will look rather stretched out after a while, but they can be, um, some people use, um, I've seen people use moss and other um, non-soil items in those particular picture frames. You have to be careful with weight depending on how large the frame is. Uh, oh, should Christmas cactus be kept in the shade? It's going to need some light to blossom, so some indirect light will help it bloom. So that's that's critical for a lot of plants. If they don't get enough light and they don't have enough nutrients or water, they won't flower. Um, I know that my Christmas cactus does look a little stressed when it's in too much sun. Most succulents will actually look a little better with a little bit of shade, especially hot afternoon light can be too intense sometimes for succulents. Um, we have noticed in our presentation by the UC Davis Conservatory she talked about her succulents looking very red when they're in too much sun because they are actually putting on their own sunscreen to prevent them from sunburning. So if you if you like the look of red succulents, you can put them in a little more sun. But most of them do need some partial shade, especially in the heat of the day in the late afternoon. Let's see, there's a question here about a propagation chamber for sedum leaves or just a pot. I think you could probably do sedum. Sedum is one of the easier ones to root, I believe. Mm -hmm. It roots from the stems usually, and I've seen salts, um, just segments of sedum will break off pretty easily, and they almost always have some little roots on them. So sedum is a, a pretty easy one generally to root from, from small stem cuttings. Uh, boy, there's lots of questions coming in. Um, let's see. Earlier question, I bought some summer dormant succulents. Do I leave them in their pots or can I repot them right now? Well, that would be like an aeonium, for example. And that's the one that's 
dormant. Um, that's the one they, they would recommend you doing this repotting and activity with the plant during winter. So probably best to leave it in its pot now. You could you could transplant it, but it's it's going to be a little stressed because it's not actually growing. So you're going to risk having some rot if you try to repot them now. They're better off waiting until the winter when they're actually actively growing. So you could do it, but you would, you would have to be very careful because they're not going to be actively growing. Um, so here's somebody, somebody's asking. Diane's asking about. Um, I received a gift of succulent pot. Uh, in a vertical three-tiered hanging wooden planter. Will they last in this type of container or should I repot them? It depends on the succulent. I mean, eventually, like a lot of the little sedums which you find in these containers, they're a ground cover and they will need space. So you're, you're gonna need to maintain. If you wanna keep that three-tiered going, you will need to edit it after a while, um, trim the long growth and maybe you know, stick some more into the ground if they're looking a little um, sparse. Any, I think it, one comment about that is any kind of container, you do have to repot your containers on a regular basis for any kind of plant because the soil that's in a container will get tired or um, compacted and it's always a good idea to repot things every few years and not necessarily every year, but um, certainly something like that. If, the, if it's not a very deep, deep container, um, you'll have to keep an eye on the plants and if they start to look stressed or have overgrown the container, you might have to redo them. So, okay, how do you know what branches to cut when pruning? Is there a method for pruning succulents? You just take them off the top down to a, a height that you like, they will grow back. I think uh, that's again going to depend a lot on the on the species as well because some of the things like as Patty mentioned, the aeoniums only grow from that that rosette tip um, and so if you pruned off that you wouldn't have any side branching happening. So it's going to depend a little bit on their growing method and how you could prune them. So there's lots of resources on succulents and you'll have to do a little research on the different ones that you actually have to find out the details for that. Uh, Chris has a question about a jade plant cutting. Can it be planted directly in the ground? You can. The jade plant is going to be frost sensitive though in here. Um, so maybe underneath an eave <laughs> where you won't need to put a blanket over it for winter. Yeah, I've seen jade plants in the ground, but they, they are, as Patty says, they're very sensitive to frost and they look just horrible after they get frosted. All the, all the leaves will fall off. So you, um, you can put them in the ground, but they'll have to be in a protected location where they will be protected from frost and cold temperatures. I think we've got everybody's questions. If you have further questions, you can also submit them through our website on our website, we have information about our help desk and we have a place where you can submit questions at any time and we would love to answer more of your questions there. So please do go to our website and um, we will answer any further questions about succulents. So I'm going to unmute Stefna and we're gonna thank you all for coming today. So I all guess- All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne and Patty. Um, that was very informative. I have some of my own succulents in, on my back deck and um, I learned a lot and I know I know now what I, I think I know now what I must be, uh, do. So uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending. I want to remind everyone that on the first uh, Thursday of the month we meet with the Master Gardeners. Next month we're going to go beyond cactus and succulents and we are going to be creating fabulous low water and dry gardens. So uh, show up Thursday, July 2nd at 7 p.m. And I just want to give a shout out to Stefna and say that the library has so many other wonderful programs as well. I know you are doing art programs and all kinds of other great things and, and making them as remote uh, accessible as possible. Um, so thank you. Check out their Great. site as well. You're absolutely correct. We do have other programs and I would like to say that next Friday night on the 12th of June, 
Art in the Library, uh, we are going to have Richard Bruns. He's going to do a presentation on his artwork. Um, he's a photographer, and that will be at 6.30. So if you could, uh, if you'd like to attend, it's uh, on June 12th, Friday night, 6.30, Art in the Library. Thank you, thank you, Vivon. Thank you for coming today, and thank you everyone for joining us, and hope you have a great success with your succulents.